Hey, welcome to Blogging Heads. Uh, I'm Alexis Madrigal, and I am here with Eli Perser. Is that how I say your last name? That's my, you, you got it right on the first try. All right, good. Um, and we're going to talk about The Filter Bubble, which is Eli's new book. Um, I actually just read it this week, and I think it is uh, really, really good. And it's an excellent translation of some of the kind of technical concepts and things that have been going on uh, in the tech space over the last decade around personalization and around the filtering of the kind of unbelievable amounts of information that we've all collectively been generating um, and kind of applying them to important social, political, uh, and commercial uh, phenomena. And I think it, as a book, it has great explanatory right. power um, precisely because I think you keep it pretty simple for us. Like there, while there is some technical detail about how these algorithms work, um, and just sort of the way that they combine a lot of different signals about your behavior into a model for you and what you might like. Um, we don't really get bogged down in, in those details, and I actually sort of appreciated it because I think the, um, the actual math is like both not that hard and also not that interesting. Um, at least that's <laughs> my, my perception. Um, yeah, I mean, there are interesting bits of it, you know, that, that in a way, you know, I sort of wished. Uh, I could do more with, you know, the, the, the conservatism of the Netflix algorithm in particular, mm. uh, you know, that essentially, and I'm not a math, uh, uh, an extremely mathy person, uh, but, uh, you know, essentially that, uh, you know, Netflix is very good at predicting a four because five-star movies tend to be more volatile and sometimes they're ones. It'll actually kind of it, it'll stick to the safe fours rather than giving you you know something that maybe you'll love it or maybe you'll hate it. But yeah, no, most of the math is you know most of this is actually pretty simple. It's just statistical you know uh, correlations. Yeah, what things go with what things. <laughs> what do, I mean, why don't we start off with Netflix? Because I think it's probably the company people most associate with uh, personalization in that way and and. Um, uh, the filtering of a bunch of different choices for you. And people tend to think of it, um, I think I've done some reporting on this too, which I can add into the conversation, but people tend to think of it as a fairly successful algorithm. So why don't you right. describe how the Netflix algorithm works? Well, I mean, it, it, you know, at the very basic level, it's, I believe, doing two things. It's looking for which other Netflix users are like you, <laughs> that can then inform, and then you look at what movies they're renting, and you show people movies that people like you rented. And then they also look at which movies cluster together. So uh, if you liked, you know, uh, uh, Lord of the Rings, then you'll probably like, you know, whatever, Star Wars. Uh, so, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, and it's basically mapping these things in space and saying which where are the clusters? Where are the things that group together? And how do we give people stuff in those clusters that they haven't already seen, but they might be interested in? Um, you know, what's interesting about you know when they when they did this Netflix challenge uh, and they and they opened it up to the whole world, um, people have started to discover all sorts of subsidiary things that you could do to refine it. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, people rate things higher on certain days of the week. Uh, you know, so Sunday ratings are higher. Basically, when you're happier, you 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 rate things higher. <laughs> and uh, I'll and so my you, Sunday and, ratings would all be like one star. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Sunday afternoon, you know, it's, it, it probably crashes like late Sunday afternoon, and everyone's like, ah, I'm work week. Um, but uh, you know, there are all sorts of sort of secondary things that they do to kind of try to normalize that data. But basically, it's pretty simple. It's just People like you get data for people like you, you know, or get movies for people like you. Got it, got it. And I mean, what's interesting about this, and, and just something I'll add only, because I, I know how much it hurts to have to say the same things about your book over and over. <laughs> I'll try and save you from that by adding in some stuff that I've done. Um, we, uh, last year, uh, went out and talked to a bunch of Netflix power users. I mean, people who had rated mm -hmm. 10, 15,000 movies. Um, and yeah. almost universally, people didn't think that the Netflix algorithm got mm -hmm. much better. Um, and it, it, it points to a kind of interesting um, 
uh, an, an interesting problem for a lot of these algorithms. The more personalized you want your recommendation to be, the worse they get at it. So there, it seems like uh, Netflix is pretty good if you rate like a hundred movies right. like most mm -hmm. people do or whatever. You know, it's, it's like, oh, okay, you're kind of an action fan and you kind of like romantic comedies, at least when no one's looking, and uh, you really like sports movies. And so it starts mm -hmm. to serve yourself. But the, the more movies that people rated, you know, these people who really just spent like, you know, were like, I'm going to train this <laughs> algorithm like a pet, um, they, they ended up getting things that made no sense or just that were totally obvious or Netflix said it had no more movies right, to rate right. for them. Um, they, they essentially yeah, broke yeah. the system by trying to be too... Uh, well, right, and, and, and this points to one of the big sort of underlying uh, tensions here, which is... Uh, the tension between kind of expressed and revealed preferences. So, um, you know, it, it, your, your expressed preferences are, I like sci-fi, I like documentaries, I want to see movies like that. Um, your revealed preferences are, you say you like these things, you know, but... I just watch, I just watch... Right, uh, I watch, from I watch all day. every episode <laughs> of 30 Rock, and it's always, you know... Uh, right. And... Um, it, you know, I think these companies are moving more and more in the direction of uh, revealed preferences. So even Netflix, um, you know, now that they have all of this data available from the streaming, they noticed that, uh, you know, the, the ratings um, aren't actually even that accurate of people's own preferences because uh, people will rate Schindler's List high because they feel kind of obligated to, you know... It, even though they didn't really enjoy it that much. Um, and uh, basically, you know, what they, now that they have the streaming, they can say, yes, well, we can tell that you watched five minutes of Schindler's List and then you flipped over to Fast and Furious 4, you know, and so we're going to show you stuff like Fast and Furious 4. And to me, what this gets to is this real question about agency. You know, it's a question about whether, uh, you know, you're making kind of, choices based on uh, conscious decisions or whether, you know, you'd rather have uh, computers sort of adapting to what you're really doing and overriding sometimes what you consciously say you want. Um, and there are, you know, there are arguments on both sides. The, 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 there's this great, um, you know, one of, the, one of the great papers in, in psychological research is called telling more, than, telling more Than You Know or Telling More Than We Know. And, uh, you know, it's, this, it, it, it's, it's a whole, it, it's sort of a meta study of how bad people are at expressing and explaining what they prefer. <laughs> uh, you know, that if you ask people, the classic example is if you ask people to describe what they like in a jam, like a, or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, they often literally describe something that they hate, but they, because nobody knows how to describe what they like in a jam. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel that way about coffee. Like, I always thought that I hate yeah. citrusy coffee. Uh, and then it turns right. out. Right. So, so what Netflix is, so, so the dilemma that Netflix has is, you know, we can go on what you say you like, or we can look at what you're actually doing and model off that. The challenge is, you know, there's, well, there are a couple of challenges there. One is, uh, you know, your, um, you're, you're basing that on some pretty narrow criteria. So it's what you like equals what you click on first. That may be a false assumption, you know. And uh, you know, then there are these feedback loops where you actually kind of because Prime works so well and what you see influences what you like. When you have what you like also influencing what you see, you know, you you, you can get into a loop. Right, right, and also, I mean, you know, one of the one of the other points in your in your book, and I think it's it's one uh, well taken. I feel like I've tried to make it in other contexts. Is just that um, you know these technologies embed um, certain ethics, even though sometimes you know it's it's not obvious to anyone um, that that's the case. I mean, you know, it, when at least in my mind, when you give Schindler's List a five star rating. What you're saying is uh, this type of movie is important to me, even if I don't want to watch it as often as I want to watch um, right. know, The Fast and the Furious. 
Um, and it's actually important that Netflix take that data into account because it sort of it reveals who you want to be. And, and I think that aspirational, um, uh, aspirational signal is, is an important yeah. one, right? I mean, I think looking at um, just, you know, broadening this discussion out from Netflix to some other parts of your book, I mean, I think that's a big, uh, a, a big part of your message seemed to be that we need uh, feedback mechanisms into these um, big data gathering organizations that say not just like, but also, you know, kind of the suggestion of having an important right. button yeah, yeah. next to the like button so that you could, you know, tilt the balance of the news that you're receiving from from uh, all the people. Right. You're and, and, you know, or, or just, to, I mean, so I think to do that, you need to both make it obvious to people that this is even happening in the first place, which it's not, um, you know, and then I think you need to give people some tools so that they can actually adjust you know, the, the, how, how they're looking at things that, that uh, you know, I mean, as a sort of silly, half-serious example, you know, you could have a slider at the top of the news feed in Facebook that goes from, here's news sort of for people very, very much like you, and then here's the news feed for people who are very different from you. You know, so I, I slide it all the way to the right, and I see my conservative friends. I slide all the way to the left, and I see my liberal friends, you know. Uh, and, and right. uh, you know, I think, you know, the, the Yochai Bengler um, had a really great article. Uh, you know, he's a law, pro right, yeah. law professor, just for, for blogging heads, viewers. You know, yeah. Law professor deals and with it. And it was a brilliant, and it was, very, it was long. It was like a 90-page legal theory article. Um, but the you know the, the punchline was essentially that um, if you look at the question of agency and freedom, you know what does it mean to, to make to, to freely be able to make choices? It's complicated because it, your the choices that you will actually make are constrained by the choices that you know are possible to make. And so you know when you deal with systems that constrain what you which choices you're aware of, you really have to be careful because you're dealing with something that gets at a very fundamental, you know, a, a very fundamental thing. Right. And I, it's interesting. I, I, the internet, uh, and particularly these filtering companies, I think start to, to, um, to, to borrow a word from the intelligence, you know, they tend to like operationalize a lot of these mm -hmm. philosophical debates that I think we've been having yeah. about how the internet works. Like the idea of uh, constraint of choices that like technology constrained choices, like in my world, oftentimes dealing with, you know, big infrastructure or something like that, you know, we'll be like, oh, well, you know, if there's no bike, like, right. people won't ride, won't ride bikes. Or, you know, if you put in a highway system, people's uh, drive versus fly or train versus drive kinds of decision-making process are totally different because they have these new options and they become aware of them. Um, but those those things are oftentimes actually uh, quite hard to see, whereas in um, in this case, they're difficult to see. Like, you know, Google's, um, uh, Google's sort of invisible curation of any search um, is maybe difficult to see, but at least we can get at it in a, in a more direct way, it feels like, right? We can we can sign out and do the same search. We can run these kind of A-B tests that are right. really difficult to do uh, with stuff that, you know, is made yeah. of atoms. <laughs> um, but maybe you can talk a little bit, um, just because I didn't know if you a chance at the top, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, just sort of like the, the filter bubble in general, because we're kind of getting, we're kind of driving right now to the kind of heart of the book, it seems like, which is... Uh, what it means to have your entire online existence filtered well, in different ways. Uh, yeah, so, so you know, the premise is that we're increasingly surrounded by Netflix-like filters that are trying to show us the stuff that we're the most likely to like. You know, that this started with uh, products, but that it's, it's, you know, spreading to content. Um, and that, uh, it, you know, as a result, the world that we see online is increasingly kind of the world that we want to see or the world that we're likely to click on, uh, the world that we're likely to have like about, um, and that, it, you know, there are some really important things that are edited out. The, the filter bubble itself is sort of my uh, little phrase for the, 
universe of information that this generates for each one of us that's actually kind of more different from everyone else's universe of information than has been the case in the past. Uh, yes, we've all chosen our own media, um, but if you choose to, you know, turn on the nation or you choose to uh, watch Fox News, you, you know, uh, you're watching it with some other people, and so there's some sense of a shared reality, and you're making a choice about it that that. Uh, you kind of understand the editing rule that's determining what gets through and what doesn't, and therefore you can make a guess about what you're missing. In the filter bubble, you know, yeah, you, I think you can. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, I'm just going to say you, you had a great way of putting this in the book, which I'm now uh, looking through here, uh, through the book for. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, um, uh, the word media, after all, now I'm, I'm quoting from the filter book now, the word media, after all, comes from the Latin for middle layer. It's, it's between us and the world. Uh, the core bargain is that it will connect us to what's happening, but at the price of direct experience. Um, and then you talk about disintermediation, which was a, a, a big right. term in Silicon Valley. Um, it's kind of this the, the con direct connection between um, producer and consumer, or between someone looking for something and someone who has something. And you say, disintermediation is as much mythology as fact. Its effect is to make the new mediators, the new gatekeepers, right. visible. And it, it, this is, to me, I mean, this is sort of uh, the, one of the big changes that, in, in the course of doing the research for the book, you know, the, the, the big shifts in how I view the internet, because I think I, I, I was really stuck in this sort of... Uh, theoretical model of the point-to-point -point internet where everyone is, you know, the, literally, you, you know, the, the, the picture is you've got a bunch of people and you've got all these lines between the people and that's what the internet looks like. And, uh, it, you know, I think that map is wrong. I think, uh, you know, increasingly it's, you know, a person and then a line to Facebook and then a line to the other person or a person and a line to Google and a line to the other person. Yeah, we, we are moving all of these information through some very heavy-duty uh, uh, systems that really do shape in, in significant ways what we see and what we don't. Um, and, you know, I, I think it, as silly as it is in some ways to talk about the Facebook like button, I think when you have something that is actually shaping the experience of 600 million people all around the world on a daily basis, you know, you kind of have to take it seriously when you say, okay, it's easy to like, uh, you know, I ran a marathon and it's hard to like genocide in Darfur, you know, or, uh, you know, that, that right. this does actually right. take what... That one might actually be easier to like in that sense, just because of yeah, 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 yeah. Like it's almost the hardest things to like are sort of like new studies right. that suggest, <laughs> you know, flooding, increased flooding in the, you know... Exactly. Lay in low land. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, and and um, you know the the it, so so the, so the valence of you know how these filters shape what we know um, is obscured because these companies say, "Ah, oh, we're just kind of like giving the information a push along." You know, they, we're not. They, don't look at us. Don't mind us. We're just we're just helping it along. Uh, and I think that's at this point they're too important to sort of let off the hook in that way. Right. I, I wonder how much of this, I mean, this is purely on the, on the personal side of things, only because I, in reading your book, um, you had a, a little section where you said, you know, you grew right. up in a small town and uh, went and got, like, Wired magazine. I mean, I had the <laughs> exact same experience growing up yeah. in a small town Washington, and, like, Wired was my connection to, you know, this whole Brewster yeah. world of things that were going on. Um, and I, I wonder if how much of what, I, I think we have really similar intuitions about um, the dangers of this filter bubble, the danger of an algorithmic society. Um, I wonder how much of our displeasure with it is generational in the sense that we were not the ones who were in Silicon Valley in the 90s. Um, you know, doing these things. We were, you know, in yeah. the middle of an high school. Um, but we were, were old enough to sort of be inflected by and influenced by the those ideas. And I think the power of 
um, a truly revolutionary medium that would go yeah. point to point now we're dealing with what essentially has been major consolidation of right. experience. Um, like I remember, you know, you probably remember this too, I mean, like going to those like hand cured sure. yachts of like yeah. the best sites of the day. And like oftentimes it was like somebody's butterfly collection that they put up on some of yeah, the yeah, yeah. ISP, like in, you know, whatever. And I had, I remember this amazing experience of connecting with this microbiologist who was at the University uh -huh. of Kansas when right. I was like 12, just because I got interested. I don't know, like whatever, some kind of strange <laughs> virus or something. And I remember like emailing him for the first time. And it was truly this this point to point interview where it was like, uh, sure, you know, we both had ISPs, but they were these local. I had a pacifier in you know, rural Washington, and he was on a, a, a education system. And now, like that whole interaction, you know, even you know, now, if I wanted to do a similar thing, I would probably have at least as good a shot finding the right. Facebook. At the very least, I would email him through Gmail, and he might respond in the same way. Um, now, the those major um, choke points for the internet, those major uh, arteries, are are they're just so big now that it's hard to do anything. Yeah, that's right. I, mean, them. I, I think, it, yeah, it's it's, it's partly well. I, I find you know Tim Tim Wu's sort of take on this fairly compelling. Uh, it, Tim Wu wrote, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gloss it so for, for Tim Wu wrote this great book called The Master Switch, which uh, I also think people should read. Uh, and uh, it, it, you know, it, basically, The Master Switch tracks the history of what he calls information empires from the beginning of the 20th century through to now. And what's interesting is that you see the same sort of cycle occur every time there's a new uh, communication medium, you know, starting with a telegraph. And, uh, you know, basically the way that it goes is that this new medium dawns, is invented, uh, people get really excited about it, they claim that it will solve all of these democratic problems. Uh, it, you know, he found these great quotes about, you know, the. The, the promise of radio, for example, to totally wire up the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, it'll be like a giant electronic brain, and you'll be, you know, this is a medium where you can talk to someone halfway around the world for, for, for free with ham radio. You know, it was like Skype only, you know, 80 years ago. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, right. And, you know, and then what happens is that, uh, it, you know, you start to have these companies emerge who profit over. Uh, you know, both extending but then also controlling the, the medium and you end up with clear channel or you end up with a few, you know, big companies that essentially uh, shut down a lot of that democratic promise and then some other medium comes along that uh, should probably be noted like aided by right. regulatory changes and the yes, government. Yes, right. I mean, that's the key, uh, you know, the, the key interaction. Like it wasn't just a natural development. Yeah, no, right. And, um, and you know, so it, it, I think the, one, one of the big questions that is, that, that I think we have to confront now is, you know, whether the internet is going to move in that direction in a whole host of, in a whole host of, of ways, um, you know, net neutrality being one dimension of that, uh, you know, and, and this stuff being another dimension of, the fact that increasingly, you know, really is uh, a handful of companies that, uh, you know, that, that, that people go through to, to live their online lives. Um, yeah. Right, right. I mean, I think it was even uh, Google's Eric Schmidt just a couple of days ago at the D9 conference saying he felt like there was a gang of four that basically shaped most people's consumer technology experience, and it was just uh, Facebook, Google, right. and Apple. Yeah, and, so I, and that's... Uh, you know, increasingly true, I think, and, uh, you, you know, the, one of the things that I thought a lot about in this, in the course of, of the book was just the, you know, uh, economies of scale in this kind of data gathering um, that, that help that, help, that help along that rich get richer kind of Okay. Consolidation. Um, so, you know, the interesting thing, I talked to someone who was in search at, at Bing, and they said, you know, actually getting an algorithm that works about as well as PageRank really wasn't that hard. You know, you can hire smart computer scientists and get something that really is, is 
not that different from you know how from Google. Uh, and what is what is challenging is that uh, you know ten years of 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 data, you know, ten years of of billions of pe people pouring their queries into this that can be used to refine. You know, it's not just the algorithm; it's the interaction of the algorithm and this massive amount of data. And so the question is, uh, you know, what uh, what is um, you know, at, at what point do Google and Facebook, in particular, maybe Microsoft, uh, you know, accumulate so much data that it becomes very hard for anyone to start up without access to to it. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can imagine basically a, a world in which, yes, you can have a competitive new idea for how to make the product, but in order for the product to really work, it has to plug into that data in some way. And I think that's actually you know, not so far from, especially Facebook's view of itself. You know, Facebook is a service that businesses plug into to get access to that pile of data. Right, right. And I found that, like, um, uh, pretty interesting. I was looking for a quote here of yours, but I will <laughs> talk about it today. Yeah, I mean, I, I found um, all the stuff about the sale of our data to be really interesting because even as someone who spent a lot of time thinking about the consumer yeah. internet, I think the kind of back channel -y advertising stuff was, was actually really surprising to me. I mean, obviously, you know people are dropping cookies right. on you for a reason, but you don't necessarily know that they're dropping it. So, and I'll, maybe I'll explain it a little uh, more clearly just for right. people yeah. who are with part of this conversation. You know, basically, if you go to a website, uh, or, or some selection of websites, they drop a little, a little tracker on you. Um, so if you were driving a car, I mean, that would literally be like a GPS tracker. And then once you leave there, it can send certain types of information back to uh, the, the site. And it's going to act as like a, a flag uh, for, uh, for other people. And I, I found like possibly the scariest thing that you write about um, was this behavioral oh, yeah. uh -huh. targeting. Um, Maybe maybe you can just talk a little bit uh, about that and just like, how, how people use it. So like if I go to uh, you know just some random website, I, I, I and then I like I go to Kayak. Right. I think that's one of the so, examples. They so give. you know Kayak, uh, you know, is a is a travel search engine. You use it to find good deals, and uh, it's free. And a lot of people wonder, well, how do they make money? And it, it, as it turns out, a significant way that they make money is that they Put a piece of they put a cookie on your computer, a little piece of data that says this is a person who has searched for flights from New York to uh, you know to uh, LA, and then uh, they turn around and all of this happens in literally milliseconds, and they auction off the right to that piece of data to other 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 ad networks and potentially other websites that want to use it to shape what you see. Um, so you can actually, you know, there's this phrase, I think, from physics, spooky action at a distance or something like that. It's sort of, <laughs> it's, it's that exactly. You can you can do something on web, one website and without apparently transferring any information, you know, open up another website that is, seems to be totally different and have it shape what happens there. Um, and Right. It was almost like yeah. a Truman Show, like you know, <laughs> but like in a in an evil information age. Yeah, way. no, it's, it, it 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 is, uh, you know, and, and I I really was sort of struggling to write a book that was not that didn't feel paranoid because I, I don't think that there's it, it's not malicious. It's sort of um, you know, there's no this isn't uh, you know sort of Big Brother. Following you around necessarily, uh, you know, the, the, most of this is just about selling you airplane tickets. But what it means is that uh, you know you increasingly uh, it's increasingly hard to escape your own identity on the net. You you uh, and actually, I think that technology is just at its infancy and it's mostly being used on ad networks. But there's really no reason that it can't be used to also shape the content that you get. Even you know the design of a website. I mean, it, it, this is something that I mm -hmm. 
I'm sort of surprised it hasn't already happened more. That, yeah, no, that, that uh, you know, if, if I'm, if I like, you know, if I respond well to hard edges and clean, you know, websites and other people like more sort of a, a baroque, you know, uh, uh, you know, presentation, you know, why not show me, you know, when I go to Sears, why not show me the sort of design image of Sears that I'm likely to be interested in? Um, so far, right, that's right, right, right. I can tell you why it doesn't happen on the content side of the house. I mean, I, I, like on the, the media, I feel like none of us have enough money to build right. the, the websites that we want. Yeah. One of them. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I mean, it, it, you know, yeah. and it was a striking moment when I was at this conference of behavioral retargeting people where they said, ah, these, you know, these, these old media institutions, they're never going to learn and they're going to, you know, the, the reason that they're, that they're uh, you know, in, in bad shape is that they need to start seeing themselves as data companies. And the New York Times starts, needs to start saying, yeah. ah, someone clicked on our article about, uh, you know, whether the BMW is, is better than the Lexus. Uh, you know, we're going to resell information about that person to someone else so that they can then sell them a car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, if there's one thing that content companies do collect, it's like fairly detailed information about what it is that you're... Right. You know, and you know, and like, the challenge, I mean, the, 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 the counter pressure is because of this stuff, you can, you no longer need the New York Times to find New York Times readers. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Oh, you had a hold on. This this actually is a, is a quote that I'm uh, <laughs> passing around the office here, um, just because I, I think it's really really important that, that yeah. people understand it. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take the time to press around on my iPad yeah. until I find right. this thing. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, so so yeah, exactly. Instead of taking out expensive advertisements in the New York Times, it is now possible to track that elite cosmopolitan readership using data acquired from Axiom or Blue Kai. These are some of these behavioral products. Um, and then you say the era where you had to develop premium content to get premium audiences, in other words, was coming to a close. And I think it's it's, it's something that I really um, have thought a lot about. Um, just this idea of of an audience being a, a, a fixed yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, because there's, there's a couple of things, and, you know, maybe I'll just divert the conversation briefly onto the media yeah. side of this. I think, you know, it was in the magazine land as an object. When you purchase the object, there was a fairly defined audience, and you could, you could get at them. Um, but there were also, like, you knew what the numbers were, uh, mm -hmm. all of those things. And I think one of the fascinating things working on the content business now is that, sure, there is, like, an audience for the New York Times and for the Atlantic and for, you know, News Beast and all these things. Um, that is defined and that is a true audience member in the sense that they're like, yes, yes I yeah. read the Atlantic. Um, and then there is a vastly larger group of people for every single website that are just kind of floating around the Internet. And they they alight on your site, and then they and then they go away. Um, and what's fascinating, I think, is that so we, we don't even know what an audience even right. looks yeah, like yeah, yeah. right now. <laughs> um, and and it makes it even more difficult because even if we did have a premium audience, it would be very difficult for us right. to identify it anyway. Meanwhile, on the, the behavioral retargeters, they can figure out who the premium audience is, and they That's don't right. care yeah. where they go. Um, the only the only question I had about this, and, and maybe this is just um, uh, a buggy whip maker, you know, hoping for more <laughs> sales or something. I, um, um, I, it doesn't it matter what it's associated with, right? So, like, if you run a Mercedes Benz ad um, on, uh, you know, if you run if you run a Mercedes Benz ad on some, you know, incredibly yeah, trashy right. thing that someone happens to be reading. Is there a danger of doing brand damage? I mean, are people talking about that? That like, if you just, if you give everything over to the yeah. ad networks, um, your advertisements, I mean, which your, your carefully guarded and crafted brand is now going to be running next to, uh, it does yeah, Leanne right. Rhyme, it's Leanne Rhyme's too skinny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Photo. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 I mean. That's actually real. I saw I, that, I I saw that on the video. Uh, and, you know the the I think the the um, definitely that's a danger, and definitely actually I think it it 
the weird thing about the online ad network, ad market, is because it's mainly driven by traditional advertising firms. I think there is this. It, it, we we aren't there yet because the the people who are buying the media still say, "I want ads on the New York Times." When I go to the New York Times, I want to see my ads. You know, people don't people. Yeah, I right. Like <laughs> well, they, you know, they haven't really, you know, a lot of the people who are doing this and, and the clients themselves, you know, haven't really gotten their heads around, you know, what all of this can do. I, you know, I think, you know, from the ad network standpoint, that sort of association thing is a is a um, is a solvable problem. You can you can have some kind of way of saying, you know, this is medium trashy, trashy, you know. Uh, high eyebrow or whatever, you know, uh, and I actually think that's going to be well, hard. Maybe I mean, but, but yeah, I don't, you know, I, you I, do I amazing right. stuff with textual yeah. analysis of, you know, reading level, you know, and right. and right. that's built into Google Docs now. Uh, you know, anyone anyone can copy and paste and find out what reading level different things are. Yeah. So uh, uh, the um, you know, so I think. It, one other place, though, that your question points is, uh, I think, in theory, some particular kinds of content ought to prime some particular kinds of ads in ways that far outperform sort of the ad alone. I mean, the thing is that it's all one experience. And so, uh, in theory, you know, um, some article that is about how awesome it is to own a car that's really fast, you know, next to the... To the to the BMW ad ought to you know that ought to make the ad do better uh, you know and and do better for branding and the thing that uh, you know that's sort of creepy about that or that's sort of uh, uh, new in this in this personalized world is um, it, it can not only be this content associates with this ad but if Eli is visiting this piece of content, he's probably in this frame of at, of mind, and therefore we're going to target these kinds of products to him. You know, uh, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I wrestled with, I, I don't know exactly what the answer is to this, but you know, it got me thinking about subliminal advertising and about how there actually are laws on the books that you can't just flash words. You know, you are thirsty in the middle of the soft drink ad. That's not allowed. It's sort of an interesting. Yeah, really. It's yeah. so ridiculous, though, right? Like you, you could say right. you are thirsty. You, you, well, and, yeah, and sorry, what I like about it is that it suggests that there's yes, this is all psychological manipulation. Yes, advertisements are are associating. You know, it arguably, it's totally intellectually and disingenuous to like put the girl in the bikini next to the Coke can, too. Those things don't have anything to do with each other. Coke's just trying to, you know, make an association. But that's fair game. Saying, you know, flashing words subliminally, you know, isn't. And I think we need to reconceptualize sort of, you know, or get better as the advertising gets more embedded in the media. We need to probably draw some clearer lines around what is fair game and what is not. Because it's going to be easier than ever uh, for ads to find us when we are in particular mindsets or particular, uh, you know, frames of mind. This, this gets to the, you know, uh, persuasion profiling uh, idea, which, it, um, you know, is basically that different people have different, um, you know, different arguments that they, were, types of arguments that they respond to. So, you know, one person might respond to everybody's doing it. Another person might respond to there's only two left. Another person might respond to the president says, you know, or nobody's doing nobody's it. Doing right. It. You'll be the first one. Uh, and, it, you know, being able to actually pitch things to people based on knowing that they respond to those kinds of offers, you know, this is sort of arguably one of the future directions for this kind of advertising. Uh, and, of course, you could do it with content as well. You could do it with sharing ideas uh, when people are in particular frames of mind. Right, right. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, one of my one of my favorite people, uh, yeah. Langdon Winter. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I think that it's it's interesting that he wrote this book in like 1980. And I don't actually think they're. I mean, he's pretty influential, but I think he kind of goes yeah. away for a long time. And then I don't know about you, but I, like he seems to be really coming back in my world as somebody um, who we should yeah. be paying attention to. Um, maybe, maybe you could talk about um, you know just who who Lamb and what it was, uh, introduce yeah. our blogging head to, uh, people well, to who've never heard of, and then uh, I yeah, no, I mean I, 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 I hope you will because I. Uh, you know, I, I, I really actually just made an acquaintance with his work, you know, when I was writing the book. And he basically was sort of uh, a professor who was interested in this question of um, what the, how the design of things, of, of technology shapes, uh, you know, how they're used and uh, how, how things are used and what the values are in them. And, uh, it, you know, it, in a way, uh, you know, he was extending a conversation that I think, uh, you know, may have preceded his work in technology in the architectural world, which was this realization that, oh, you know, urban planning isn't just a matter of finding efficient solutions to things. It's actually a matter of what kind of city do we want to live in and how do we design it in a way that it supports that style of life. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people, you know, look at Robert Moses as mm -hmm. one of the first people who really got this in a major way and who, um, you know, designed New York with a very particular view of what kind of city he wanted it to be and which kinds of people got to go where. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so there was this conversation that bubbled over in the architectural world about, uh, Oh right, you know what we're doing has actual like political and social consequences, and then, as I understand it, you know Langer, Langer Winner sort of amplified that and took it into the technological realm and said, this doesn't just apply to places; it also applies to technologies. Technologies, you know, have these valences, and some kinds of technologies will bring people together in some ways, and some kinds of technologies will bring people together in other ways. It really matters, actually, what what how they're designed. Um, well, what's totally, what, totally. I mean, you, you sound like you you actually are more familiar. So, uh, oh yeah, I also just um, you know, I, mean, I think I would, I would just going to point out. I mean, have this, this is just I'm just going to read from your book just a tiny bit here. Um, uh, we say, on the face of it, a bridge is just a bridge, but often, as Winner points out, architectural and design decisions are underpinned by politics as much as aesthetics. Like goldfish that grow only large enough for the tank they're in, we're contextual beings. How we behave is dictated in part by the shape of our environments. Put a playground in a park and you encourage one kind of use, build a memorial and you encourage another. And then you point out that the algorithms of Google and Facebook may not be made of steel and concrete, but they regulate our behavior um, just as effectively. And I think it, a really interesting thing um, about winter and... Um, and I, I've struggled with this, and, and I think he himself struggles with this in, in uh, one of his books, The Way yeah. on the Reactor. Um, you know, he, he says uh, something about technological determinism, like to say that I'm a technological determinist uh, is to, you know, um, apply, you know, uh, to a really, a really narrow, um, a really narrow definition of like what he believes of the role of, of artifacts right. are in shaping behavior, but. But I do think that he doesn't quite give enough um, uh, enough openings for human action. And you, I mean, you don't do that in your book, but I think mm -hmm. Winner specifically does. And I think there's been this kind of emergent conversation, um, actually kind of more emerging out of the, the user experience, user interaction research field, yeah, about affordances, right. and it just that certain technologies um, May not dictate behavior in um, in hardcore ways, but they allow certain types of behavior that we can actually design systems that allow a greater variety of, of behaviors. And a great example of that is something you mentioned at the mm -hmm. at the top of our conversation: the idea that on your Facebook news feed it would have a right. slider bar that would say "Show me this much news" versus that. That opens the affordance. Right now, Facebook, I think, is is largely bad in the ways that it's bad um, because it's so sim It's designed to be so simple that there's very few affordances. It's so trimmed down. It's like it's as if your word processor 
literally only had the letters and you couldn't right. change anything about yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Right? That was it. It was a blank document for typing. Um, and there, there are certainly trade-offs. That, that, like, you know, they're, they're, the only thing that's not like that is because of their <laughs> privacy policy yeah. you know, on your book too, right? That's the only thing where it's just this like, totally Byzantine yeah. and difficult to figure out thing. But the main user experience, the dominant user experience is so simplified with so few ways of changing the things that are, that are going on. And I guess um, I think one of the solutions, and we, we should get to that too, is sort of like what right. you think we should do at the end. But I think at least one of the conceptual tools that, that people could have is that technologies, while they shape our behavior because we have to act through them and restricts our choices and stuff, those systems can be designed um, not just to um, give us, say, a better experience, but to give us a more open experience that lets us tweak our, our filter bubble <laughs> um, to be a better kind yeah. of filter bubble. Like at this point, we have to guess that filters are going to be there, but the transparency of the bubble can be changed by changing some of these um, kind of basic settings. Um, how totally. Well and it, you know, that, that, that's one of the reasons that I, um, you know, uh, am a fan of uh, uh, Twitter as opposed to Facebook, um, although I use Facebook an awful lot also. Uh, <laughs> Is you know that it, for two reasons related to this. One is um, the systems, you know, in this conversation about affordances, you know, systems that are easily intelligible to users are more malleable by them. You know, and Twitter is a great example of that in that a lot of the best things about Twitter actually came from the user community. You know, so hashtags uh, yeah. in particular, those little like pound sign and, and a word. Uh, you know that that uh, was an innovation that that people on Twitter came up with. That because you know, or the reach was right, and uh, you know, because that was because it was so because you knew exactly how the thing worked, you could build things off it that worked. Um, is Facebook, which seems to change by the day, it's much harder to participate in making Facebook because you know you. you you can try something, and then Facebook changes how it's done tomorrow, and it's all it all goes away. Um, you know, so I think it's an argument for uh, trying to push towards platforms that do have some kind of transparency in them, that have uh, you know some some that are that are easy to understand how they how they work, so that you can participate in making them. Um, yeah, I, I think the only thing I'll add there is, you know, a great example of Twitter uh, yeah, not right. doing that <laughs> is, you know, in, in the old days, in order to retweet something on Twitter, you would just go, you would type RT at, and that person's username, so RT at uh, Alexa General, and then whatever I said. Um, and because the characters were limited, et cetera, et cetera, people oftentimes would um, make small modifications, to shortening words, or maybe dropping off um, hashtags at the end, or, or whatever it, it was. There was a ton of flexibility, um, and it was sort of a spirit of the law kind of thing. Sort of, you know, as long as I sort of capture the intent, or you'd use the rules of quoting, so you'd go like something dot 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 at mm -hmm. the end of that thing. You basically had all of the flexibility right. supported by language. Uh, with the new retweet, um, it. It is impossible to do that. It is an exact duplicate of whatever that person said, including, like, say, they misspelled something. I used to, I used to correct the spelling. You know, it's for it's. I used to correct that and retweets for them so we wouldn't like to echo yeah, the, right. the error. Um, and and another, you know, so you know that's kind of one piece of it. The other amazing thing is if you use one of the Twitter clients um, that allow you to quote the retweet. Right, it's obvious. It's quite intentional. So you know, on the Twitter client yeah. on the iPhone, say, if you hit retweet, it gives you the option of the exact duplicate, or it'll let you quote it. And when it does that, it puts it into a form. That is to say, the tweet goes out there with quotes right. at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm air quoting here, Neil. I just you know, um, and it doesn't do what everyone has always done, which is RT at yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the whole the whole thing. And um, I actually think that that was an intentional choice by the Twitter um, iPhone app engineers to push people to use it yeah, their yeah, yeah, yeah. In native retweet as opposed to the kind of community developed right. ragtag one. Um, and it's just it just goes to show how like how they can use. I mean, they're embedding a notion of how retweeting right. should work 
into this software solely by making it just a little bit more difficult than you want it to be in order to use the old style retweet. Exactly. You just do yourself. And I think it's a it's such a perfect little parable for how engineers embed their own values about what a retweet should be. Because for them, it's about data integrity. It's about <laughs> capturing as much data as possible about which tweets are popular and which are not. Well, it, it, it's also what drives me nuts about engineers saying, you know, we're not doing anything normative here. We're not... Uh, you know, we're, we're just building code that helps people do what they want. Uh, you know, and, and it's amazing to me how many people still kind of hold on to that image of what they're doing, even though, you know, anyone who has played with this kind of technology knows that that rule of friction is incredibly powerful. You know, that it, the, the difference between opting in and opting out is is almost all the difference. Uh, you know, and, and that... Right. The fact that, uh, you know, and, and that, you know, decisions about how things are ranked or what you see and what you don't, you know, that they are editorial decisions with, you know, social and political context. You know, they don't, they're not, mm -hmm. there's no, you know, there's no getting back to, it's just, it's just code. It doesn't believe in anything because people do. Um, right, 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 right. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, I think we're pretty much at the, yeah. at the end of our time here. Thanks so much um, for... What do you... Yeah, absolutely. Th thank you. Um, and, and thanks for writing the book. I, I really um, enjoyed it and, and thought that uh, it should bring this idea, I think, to the attention of the people that really need to know hopefully. about it, <laughs> which are just, you know, both everyday people as well as those. Um, we didn't really yeah, have yeah. political implications for a lot of these things, but I think it's it's... Uh, right. It's pretty clear because, as you said, um, you know the political world is usually about five years behind the commercial world, which means this next election cycle might right. see a lot exactly. of things yeah. happening. Great. Well, uh, thanks so much. Great. Great talking to you. All right. All right. Talk Take to you later. Bye-bye.